what is the mission of the church? That is a question that has been heavily debated throughout certain times in church history. What is the mission of the church? How would you summarize for someone who asked you, what is the mission of the church? What is the church left here by God to be doing, to be about, to pursue? Do you have a list of passages in your mind that you would go to, oh, that passage and that passage, and I would take them here to this passage? It would be helpful to have those things. This morning, we're going to seek to clarify the mission of the church, what the mission of the church is and is not. And so the title of this lesson is Just Ecclesiology, Just Ecclesiology, Ecclesiology being the study of the church, coming from that Greek word ekklesia, having to do with the church. And so we want to know this morning, what is the church's relationship to God's justice, to true justice? And to do that, to get at that, we have eight reproofs correcting the church's pursuit of social justice. Eight reproofs correcting the church's pursuit of social justice. These will be eight biblical corrections, eight categories that actually reveal the error in the church's pursuit of what's called social justice. And these will provide also a corrective for such thinking. It is popular, as you're probably well aware, that to believe that the church is supposed to be about something other than the salvation of souls and the discipleship of those souls. That the church is also to be about establishing just institutions and ensuring that uh, what's called shalom is established here and that image bearers of God have uh, whatever the category of justice that people deem suitable, that they have access to those things. Uh, we'll talk about some of those. But we want to clarify what is actually the church's mission and what it is not. So here are eight reproofs correcting the church's pursuit of social justice. These things stand as immovable, fixed categories in Scripture, fixed realities in Scripture, to which we can look for correction in our thinking about the church's mission. The first of those categories is Old Testament Israel. Old Testament Israel. Old Testament Israel before and after the Mosaic Law, is actually helpful to clarifying what the church is to be about. And that may sound odd at first. But to realize that God never required his people, even in the Old Testament, to ensure that just systems were practiced in the world generally is helpful. Never in Scripture do we see God commanding his people generally in Israel in the Old Testament or in the church in the New Testament to establish or ensure equity in society at large or among unbelievers generally. Israel is no exception to this rule. Oftentimes people in favor of social justice will quote some Old Testament context, some Old Testament passage, law, example as proof that Christians individually and the church corporately ought to labor for just systems in the world. Now, certainly, wherever Christians find themselves, there are a variety of occupations represented in this room. There are a variety of spheres of influence. And we would hope that wherever you find yourself, Christian, that you are doing whatever God's justice requires, that you are making sure that the people in those spheres of influence where you have contact are granted whatever God says is due them, whatever respect, honor, 
etc. people are due that they're that they get it from you. And if you have oversight over a job, for example, then you would want to make sure that the right things in those spheres of influence are happening under your oversight. But this is far different than ensuring that just systems everywhere are established. And what we oftentimes fail to do is give adequate thought to Old Testament Israel and the context of these passages in which the Old Testament commands are given, or we fail to give adequate thought to the extent to which those Old Testament laws were even applied in Israel. So I'll give you a few examples. Exodus 22, verse 25, that talks about lending practices in Israel. That verse, Exodus 22, 25, says, If you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you are not to act as a creditor to him. You shall not charge him interest. Notice the phrase, to the poor among you. This was not to, this was not given to, to Israel to say when you get into the promised land, after you've done, you, you've completed the driving out and extermination of the Canaanites, whoever's left around, practice these lending practices with them. It's specifically the poor among you. In Numbers 35, verses 9 to 13, having to do with the the cities of refuge, this is also a helpful series of laws. There were cities of refuge that if someone killed someone accidentally, God had Israel identify six cities after they conquered the land to which these people who had accidentally killed another human being could flee and have safety. Verse 9, Numbers 35, Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall select for yourselves cities to be your cities of refuge that the manslayer who has killed any person unintentionally may flee there. The city shall be to you as a refuge from the avenger, so that the manslayer will not die until he stands before the congregation for a trial. The cities which you are to give shall be your six cities of refuge. And there were three across the Jordan and three on the other side of the Jordan where the tribes eventually settled. Notice how those laws are specific to Israel and actually required specific boundaries of land. These were not for the Canaanites or the world at large. One more example, Deuteronomy 24. We've looked at this once before already. Verses 19 to 20 talked about how to care for the disenfranchised, so to speak, the aliens, orphans, widows. Deuteronomy 24, starting in verse 19, when you reap your harvest in your field and have forgotten a sheep sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow, in order that Yahweh your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive tree, you shall not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and the widows. This was what we discussed before under Mosaic law. There was provision for the truly needy. This was a matter of God's justice. But Israel was not tasked with establishing justice somewhere outside of Israel. This is for the alien among them in the land, identifying perhaps temporarily with God's people, 
and then orphans and widows in Israel. You never see Israel or Israelites going to establish just systems in other places. And certainly this wasn't done through political uh, ploys or strategies. So all of these were specific to what Israel were, was to practice within Israel. That's why, again, Ruth and Naomi don't stay in Moab and wait for some sort of social services for widows from, from Israel to, to reach them. They get back in the land where they should have been among God's people and then find someone practicing God's justice. Uh, take Micah 6, 8 a favorite passage uh, that we hear often today. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does Yahweh require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Not only is Micah addressing individuals, right, not a system, you'll notice in that passage as signified by the phrase, O man, he's speaking to individuals in Israel, uh, Judah specifically, But he's requiring God's people to practice justice wherever they had the authority to do so, namely within the nation of Israel where God had set those just laws. And so this is helpful for the church to understand that in a similar way, even though we don't have land as Israel did, we're not one ethnic people with whom other people need to come in and identify But the church is a called out, gathered, organized organism of people. And this is where God has given us jurisdiction to practice and ensure justice. Similar as as Israel was not required by God, you don't even see the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, practicing or ensuring justice in the world at large. Uh, Joseph being the the unique one in that list because he actually had a political position in Egypt. Um, But he doesn't go anywhere outside of Egypt seeking to establish justice. And so even in a a verse like Micah and, and all throughout the prophets, what the prophets are doing are calling God's people back to God's law. And this is, they're seeking to to ensure justice specifically by faith and repentance. That's key as well. You don't see the prophets, like many preachers in our day, seeking to leverage political power and lobbying for just institutions. They sought to bring about justice specifically through faith and repentance and adherence to God's word. Walt Kaiser helpfully says, commenting on the prophets, the Old Testament prophets did not make their primary appeal to the structures or institutions of their society, but to the individuals who made up those communities and institutions. What is more, the lever they proposed to cause a revolutionary turnabout was the word of God itself, rather than direct sociological tinkering or political agitation. Thus, the Old Testament prophets were revolutionaries who did indeed hate with a passion every form of oppression, injustice, and unrighteousness, but they viewed these ills as being mere symptoms of deeper spiritual problems, which cried out for each individual to respond to the declared word of God. Take the one of the outliers among the prophets, Jonah, who specifically went to a pagan nation, he didn't seek to establish organizations and institutions based on something other than or aside from faith and repentance. Where does he go? He goes and he preaches repentance in the city. And the people repent. And the city was changed for a time, for a generation or so. The church could learn from those examples. That is the means that God has given us, the gospel, 
his word to actually affect societal change. So Old Testament Israel is a reproof to churches pursuing social justice because Israel wasn't instructed to pursue social justice the way that churches are insisting today. Under Mosaic law, God required Israel to focus their attention on justice among God's people. This is also a reproof to churches pursuing social justice because the Old Testament saints sought to accomplish justice by preaching repentance and faith in God's word, not by various political strategies and social revolution. So heart change, according to the prophets, was the means by which social societies became just. It was heart change. That was the means by which societies became just. Uh, they didn't seek to establish God's justice apart from or despite uh, conversions or a lack of conversions. And at times, revival uh, is, what, is what was used by God to produce just societies. A second reproof to the church's pursuit of social justice is the Great Commission. The Great Commission turned to Matthew 28, that famous passage, passage that Jesus clearly outlines at this all-important meeting in Galilee for his disciples what they need to be about when he is gone. This is a reproof to the church's pursuit of social justice because some would have us believe that the church has a dual mission or a two-pronged mission. Uh, that is to preach repentance and faith in the gospel on one hand, as well as to renew or redeem culture and to work to establish justice in the world on the other hand, that the church should be doing both of these things. One proponent of, of this view articulates this view of the church's mission this way. Anthony Bradley says this, when we think about justice, we're thinking about the ways in which God intends people to be treated because they're made, made in his likeness and his image. And because of that, the church then is concerned and burdened with all the issues that undermine the dignity of men and women in urban centers. That includes things like education, jobs, health care, etc., that all those things are associated with people being treated according to what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. So as the church moves forward and applies the gospel to people's lives, we also want to speak the gospel into the situations that might undermine their dignity. So we're thinking about the ways the church can speak prophetically to systems and structures as men and women are being formed and shaped by the gospel in the context of the church. You can see how the gospel and the church are really a means to the greater end, it seems, of social reform. But the Great Commission provides a a helpful instructive, or a helpful corrective to this kind of thinking. Look at verse 18 in Matthew 28. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples, disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Notice that Jesus does not include in these words this succinct way to capture what the church is to be about. He does not include a cultural mandate alongside discipling nations. The way he captures the mission of the church, which is to disciple nations, is by doing a couple of things. Verse 19, as you're going, do this. Make disciples of all nations. How? One, baptizing them. Baptizing them. That is the entrance into discipleship 
is baptism. That's how you make a disciple. You preach the gospel. Whoever responds, they enter into discipleship in a local church through baptism. In the, you baptize them in the singular name, one name, three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And once they are baptized, verse 20, then you in, embark upon the unending task of teaching them to observe all that Jesus commanded his disciples. All that Jesus commanded them. You teach disciples who have been baptized all that Jesus commanded the church to be about and do. And that's the, the rest of your, your New Testament unfolds those commands by Jesus. His words when he was on earth, we have in the Gospels, what he did early on in establishing the church in Acts, and the, the various teachings of the apostles that unfolded, much of them in, in the book of Acts. Notice that he does not say, hey, teach, baptize them, and teach them to do everything that I did. Why doesn't he say that? That's interesting, because Jesus did a lot of things that some have sought to say are associated with social justice. He healed the sick. He uh, fed hungry people. Is the church to be about those things? Jesus did them. Well, Jesus actually doesn't leave us any pattern in the New Testament for, for performing miracles, for raising the dead, for... Uh, feeding 5,000, Jesus, teach me how to multiply food. That would be really useful, you know, to feeding hungry people. He doesn't leave us any instructions and, and does leave us with the instruction. It's what I taught you to do and be about that I want you to reproduce in local gathered assemblies of believers everywhere. And then he gives this promise, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus' promise of his abiding presence with his disciples, that's lo, I am with you, y'all, y'all, always, right? Good Greek sounds southern, <laughs> the second person plural. So Jesus promises his abiding presence with his gathered disciples, with the local church, specifically in reference to being with them as they carry out this mission of the church. As the, the church carries out this, he promises to be with them. So in other words, to add to this, to compromise this, to divert our attention to doing something else other than this, we would actually forsake the promise of Jesus' abiding presence. Jesus is not promising here to be with parachurch ministries doing whatever they think the church needs to be done. He is not promising his abiding presence to individual Christians not in this passage, but as he articulates what the church is to be about, and as the church pursues that, then he promises to be with them. So as, as the church fails to, to one degree or another to practice this, they sacrifice and forsake the abiding presence of Jesus. If you want to know where Jesus is, especially favorably, then look for local churches baptizing and teaching people to do everything Jesus commanded, discipling the church. That should be an encouragement to us because this is really what we're about, singularly so. We're intentional about our discipleship of men and women. We need to excel still more. There are ways that we could excel still more in this but certainly by conviction and pursuit, this is what we're about. 
by the way, if, if the church was actually successful at this, if we, if we were successfully, every church everywhere, discipling nations, teaching people to obey everything Jesus commanded, wherever they found themselves, wherever they had influence, then we, it would result in just systems. If you convert the people in those systems and teach them to practice justice, God's justice, true biblical justice, the systems would be different. Some, some see that as too small, though. You know, just preaching the gospel is not enough to change the world. Well, in one sense, I would agree, because Jesus taught us more than just the gospel, penal, substitutionary atonement, a sinless substitute, enduring God's wrath for sins before he resurrected. Right? That's the gospel. Men must repent and believe that to inherit eternal life. And Jesus taught more than that. But that's not what people mean when they say just preaching the gospel isn't enough. If we were just doing that, that would be plenty to do. It is plenty to do. If you you spend time with the pastors, you know your pastors are, are busy men. I don't know where we would get time to be about other things other than caring for the body, evangelizing, building up disciples. The enemies of the church in Acts 17.6 thought that this was actually an effective way to change the world because they said about Paul and his companions, they have turned the world upside down just preaching the gospel, just discipling nations was enough to turn the world upside down. So I agree with them. It's interesting to note uh, one, one incredible example of this, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he did not, he was actually uh, steadfast and immovable in his conviction about what the church was to be about. He didn't bother with all the pragmatic ways of getting people in the church and keeping them in the church in his day either. And as it pertains to his influence, one observer says that in Scotland, or in in South Wales, there were two men, two men who kept South Wales from communism in the 1930s. While communism was making all kinds of advances politically and into other nations, one observer said that two men were responsible for keeping South Wales from this. One was Anurin Bevan, who was a politician, he held back the politically minded. And the other was Martin Lloyd-Jones, who kept such large numbers of chapel goers to the Christian faith in his day. Sound, convictional, experiential preaching from Martin Lloyd-Jones, at least according to one lawyer, was enough to help prevent South Wales from becoming communist. God's word works to whatever degree he deems that it will. And so we can be satisfied with that. A third reproof to the church's pursuit of social justice is the sheep-goat judgment. The sheep-goat judgment. If you turn a few pages in your Bible back to Matthew 25, we see the sheep-goat judgment. This is that popular passage that talks about caring for the least of these, and if you've done it for the least of these, you've also done it for me. And on the face of it, this might seem like a a good passage to say, see, Christians are people who care for the poor and disenfranchised and homeless and hungry. You know, where's the Grace Bible soup kitchen? Let's just read through this passage and we'll see how the details clarify what this passage is actually about. Starting in verse 31 of Matthew 25. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. 
Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent you did it, to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in naked, and you did not clothe me sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will also go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This verse has been used to say that Christians will practice activism and, and, and to some degree to pursue social justice among the poor and destitute that this is obligatory for Christians and for the church based on this text. But this idea certainly is not supported in the least by this text for a number of reasons. And the issues can really be categorized into two major categories. And, and the, the primary issues with using this text for that reason really fall into two categories of the recipients of the kingdom on one hand and B, the recipients of the charitable deeds. The recipients of the kingdom and the recipients of the charitable deeds demonstrate that this is not the text to be leveraged for an argument for social justice. So first, the, the recipients of the kingdom. When Jesus comes to establish his kingdom on earth, Notice that that's what's happening in verse 31. He's coming with his angels in all his glory to sit on his glorious throne. The judge of all the earth is coming, and he's going to rule King Jesus. The recipients of the kingdom, according to uh, verses 32 to 40 and verse 46, are those who receive the kingdom, okay? And... and uh, those who do not are in the next section. Uh, 30, they're mentioned in verses 32 and 33 and described in verses 41 to 46. Those who receive the kingdom are called by a variety of titles throughout this text. I don't know if you noticed that. They're called by a variety of titles. Verses 32 and 33, they're called the sheep. In verses 33 and 34, they're called those on his right, on Jesus' right hand. Uh, this is indicating a favorable position with King Jesus, right, to be seated at his right hand. The right hand is always a position of favor. They're also called in verse 34, you who are blessed of my father. And in verses 37 and 46, they're called the righteous. Okay. If these things are a reference, these, these, if these charitable deeds are a reference to good done generally in the world, like feeding the homeless, uh, clothing the homeless, visiting the sick, just generally in the world, well, unbelievers practice those things. Atheists practice those things. 
millionaires who hate God and Christ are philanthropists and well-known for their philanthropic efforts. If these charitable deeds are a reference to good done in the world generally, then you would have to conclude that God is giving the kingdom to unbelievers who have practiced these things generally. Because that's the criteria on which he gives them the kingdom. He identifies them as those who are worthy of inheriting his kingdom. That's a major problem for Christians seeking to use this passage to argue for social justice. Unbelievers do these things. And so you would have to conclude that then the recipients of the kingdom are something other than, or that unbelievers are his sheep, those on his right, you who are blessed of my father and called righteous by Jesus. But these, these titles are never used of unbelievers, as you know. These are only used of people who believe the gospel and trust in Christ for salvation. So what makes these deeds of charity then distinctly Christian? What makes them practiced in this passage by Christians? And that's the, the second category, the recipients of the charitable deeds. Notice in verse 40, the king will answer and say to the ones inheriting the kingdom. Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, <clears throat> one of these brothers of mine, even the least of these brothers of mine, the least of them, you did it to me. This is not the least of these out generally in the world and, and abroad. This is not the poor destitute of the world. This is talking about the ones of the least means who are brothers of Jesus. Those are the ones who receive the charitable deeds. In both sections of, of what Jesus, of what we've read, of, of who Jesus is referencing, he, the sheep and the goats, notice that whatever was done for the least of these brothers of mine was also done for Jesus. Whatever was done for them is done for Jesus. That means that these people who receive the charitable deeds are unified with Christ. They're, they possess such a unity with Jesus, King Jesus, that to do something for them, to love them, is to love Christ. It sounds like uh, reminiscent of Acts 9. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Well, in persecuting the church, Paul was persecuting Christ. So the recipients of the charitable deeds are brothers of Jesus. They're brothers of Jesus by virtue that they have the same father as Jesus. And you can write down John 20, verse 17. John 20, 17, as well as Hebrews chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Jesus calls believers his brothers. The apostles in John 20 tell my brothers and then in Hebrews 2, which actually is quoting Psalm 22, I will sing your praise in the midst of the congregation, referencing Jesus' brothers. And then Isaiah 8, these, these brothers of mine, um, in Hebrews 2. These are, these are believers. At the sheep and goats' judgment, it is so clear who is worthy of the kingdom, that the only criteria Jesus needs is, how did you love the church? How did you love the church, specifically the, the least in the church? And on that criteria alone, Jesus can say, those are the ones who are deserving of the kingdom. Because only a Christian would do that. 
You ever, you ever seen a, a non-governmental organization giving charitably to the church to give to the church? No. To feed Christians who need it? To clothe Christians who need it? To aid persecuted Christians who are in prison for their faith? No. You ever see the world and secular philanthropists give to the church to help the church? No. So on that basis, Jesus can say, you're out, you're a goat. The church, who every believer loves the church, gets the kingdom. Do you love the church? Do you take note of those among us who are needy? I know you must, because when needs arise, they are taken care of. This church has uh, repeatedly, year after year, met budget because of your generous giving. Praise God for this church's love for the church. And we should excel still more. A few, a few final things to, to mention. Uh, number four, another reproof to the church's pursuit of social justice is Jesus' new commandment in John 34 and 35. Uh, 13, 34, and 35. So often the idea, the mindset seems to be that our pursuit of justice among the world, our feeding the hungry and, and etc. in the world will gain us a hearing with them. They will be more inclined to believe the gospel if we feed them first. If you have the opportunity, that, that might be a useful opportunity to have a meal with someone if you're not going to get their attention any other way. But does that make the world more receptive? to the gospel? Does that make them more inclined to believe our message if we feed them first? Uh, John 6 seems to indicate absolutely not. No one did more good to the world when he was on earth than Jesus himself, and he was rewarded with death. And he told the church the same thing would happen to them. They hate the master of the house. They'll hate you. It's par for the course. But even Jesus' explicit new commandment that he gives to his disciples tells us if we want people to know we're on Team Jesus, what we must be about, if you want your witness to your neighbors, to your unbelieving family members, to, to speak the loudest that you are in fact a disciple of Jesus, what should you be about? It's not social justice. Look at what he says. A new commandment, verse 34, I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. One another, one another, one another. Many of the small groups have been studying the one another's specific manifestations of love for one another all throughout the New Testament. And Jesus says in verse 35, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. What a strange strategy to prove unity with Jesus, to love the church. The world will be convinced, Jesus says, that you belong to him with the rest of the church, by how the church loves the church. And Acts is, is irrefutable, irrefutable proof of that reality because that's what you see them doing. Every time they are about what the church is about, including church discipline, which we'll look at next, taking care of their own widows, evangelizing the lost, and building up disciples, devoting themselves to the disciples, the apostles' uh, teaching and the breaking of bread and fellowship and prayer, whenever you see them doing that, so often what happens? The word spreads 
and numbers, disciples are added to their number. If you want to prove to the world that you belong to Jesus, love the church well. Make, prioritize that in all of your good deeds. Church discipline, according to 1 Corinthians, is another reproof for the thinking that the church should be pursuing social justice because specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul clarifies where God has given the church authority to practice justice, to ensure justice, to function as a judge. Where does God give the church authority to play judge. It's only and always in the church. <clears throat> Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 9. Paul has to clarify for the wayward Corinthians, the disorderly church in Corinth. I wrote to you, verse 9, in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous, and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. To play judge and start judging immoral people outside of the church, where does that leave you? With no friends, right? Verse 11, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. Ah, any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I, Paul says, to do with judging outsiders? I'm an apostle of the church. What do I have to do with judging outsiders outside the church? And then he says, even for the Corinthians, do you not judge those who are within the church, the apostle and the members function as judges inside, locally, but remove those who are outside, or excuse me, but those who are outside, God judges, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. That's where you get to play judge. And this is as close as I think the, the New Testament gets to a specific prohibition against the church adopting social causes as a part of its mission. You do not play judge. We do not play judge out in the world, right? The church does, has no business adopting as part of its mission ensuring just systems. Again, wherever a Christian finds himself, he's going to be merciful, he ought to be gracious. He ought to be kind and generous and loving. That's what we do as Christians. We're, we're perfectly suited for that kind of activity. But to adopt as part of what we do as a congregation, Tearing down unjust systems, ensuring that better ones get established. That's just not the church's business. If we did that, we would actually sacrifice what we were supposed to be doing. When we remove a sinning brother, that is the church operating within the jurisdiction that God has given us the authority to operate. So that's how you know the boundaries of the church's judicial jurisdiction. Because God has only given us recourse in, in one arena, and that's in, in the church. That is just ecclesiology. Paul does actually say, if you, if you, go, for, if you go down into chapter 6, that we won't always be restricted in our judgment in these ways. One day we'll judge angels. That's just not today. Our, our, our judgment remains within the church. Some other categories to think in, and we'll, we'll blow through these. Uh, the apostles' example, the apostles' instruction, and the apostles' commendation. 
are also reproofs against adopting social justice causes for the church. We won't, we won't read it. We're running out of time. But it's interesting to note in Acts 16, the Macedonian man, Paul has a vision of a Macedonian man who says, come help us, come and help us. Paul is prevented from going to other places that he intends to go. And then he's given a vision by God of a Macedonian man, however he knew it specifically it was him. Come help us. He doesn't give any further details about the kind of help he needed. If we had a vision, if, that, if God was still operating in that way in our day, a lot of pastors would have that vision and go, oh man, I wonder what he needs help with. Perhaps they're hungry. Perhaps they don't have clean water. Perhaps they have poor education systems. Perhaps they don't have adequate health care. We need to go to Macedonia, guys, and we need to survey the community, and we need to find out what do you need help with, community? We're here to help you, the church. And we need to collect those surveys, and we need to decide what we're gonna, how we're going to go and help the community. Interesting, before Paul even got to Macedonia, he knew exactly what he was supposed to do. Verse 10, Acts 16, I'll read this. When he had seen the vision, immediately, Luke says, we sought to go to, into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Wow. I, I haven't been there, but I know what we're supposed to do. Preach the gospel, establish a church, disciple the nation of Macedonia, right? The, the people in that nation. How did Paul know? How did Paul know from a guy asking for help? Because God's already made it clear what help we all need and what the church is supposed to be about. So if you're clear on the church's mission, then you don't need anything more specific than to know that there are sinners in a place without a church who's preaching the gospel and discipling, or there are a lack of sufficient churches in a, in a specific place. So we could go anywhere where there are sinners in need of the gospel and know what the church should be about. We could go to Maricopa. We could go to Tucson. We could go to Flagstaff. We could go to Texas, we could go to Oregon, Seattle, and if you're really sacrificial, you could even go to California. <laughs> we could go to New Orleans, we should go to New Orleans. We could go anywhere. Where are, where are they sinners who need the gospel? Where's there a need? Let's bring the gospel. The apostles' explicit instruction is also helpful. In James 1.27, he says that true religion is to care for widows and orphans. My wife and I, as we have been within the foster care system, providing a home for, for orphans over the years and been in training, it's, it's really sad to see a lot of Christians who have been obligated by their pastors and, and others with strong desires for foster care. And praise God, that's great that people have those desires to adopt and foster. But they, they've been, their consciences, other Christians have been, had their conscience burdened to solve the problem of foster care and adoption. You know, you've probably heard, if, if every Christian family in America adopted just one child, there would be no more foster care system, no more need for it. If that happened, I think that'd be great. <laughs> but is that the obligation of every Christian or the church to provide a solution for that? No. James is speaking specifically to believers caring for their own, and you see that worked out in a passage like Acts 6 when they actually care for their widows. And even in the criteria in 1 Timothy 5, you can write down, 
the criteria for the church caring for widows is so extensive that no unbelieving widow would meet the criteria to receive care from the church. So this, the apostles' explicit instruction to the church for how to care for the disenfranchised, so to speak, has to do with the church with, with, within. If, if Emily and I died today, somebody in Grace Bible better adopt our kids, and the rest of y'all better support them. They're adopting Ezekiel, my youngest. <laughs> Hurricane Zeke, we call him Hurricane Zeke for a reason. <laughs> They're going to need support, whoever adopts them. <laughs> last, last thing I'll mention, uh, the apostles' commendations. There is never a single, among all the commendations to individuals and churches corporately, not a single commendation given to an individual or a church corporately for practicing social justice, for renewing the culture, for redeeming the society that they were in, not a single one. And so if you want to justify making social justice some part of the church's mission, even half of it, then you have to go outside of Scripture to find people being commended for such things. This should not make us less compassionate it should make us more focused. It should make us more singular in our priorities. And it should make us bring more people into the church, into what God is doing, where God's justice is being practiced. You want to have mercy on the world? Bring them into the church where they can see justice practiced. And it should make us more eager to evangelize and disciple to take spiritual responsibility for those within Grace Bible Church. Do you take spiritual responsibility for anybody in this church? Have you taken it upon yourself to see them made complete in Christ? That's not just your pastor's job, right? We must be about that. And because we're not distracted with other things, no group of people should be more ardent evangelists and disciplers than we should at Grace Bible Church and churches who believe like we do. God, thank you so much for your word. It is clear, and it clarifies our understanding. What a magnificent God you are. We thank you for sharing your wisdom with us in your word. In Christ's name, amen.